Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, first of all, I'd like to, to say thanks to Rosie and ZSL for the invitation to talk this morning. So by way of introduction, I'm a biologist and I'm based in the research team at, at Woodchester Park in Gloucestershire. And the team there has, has researched badgers and TB for, for over 30 years. And that includes a long, a long running collaboration with, with Mark and his team over the, developments of, the development of vaccines for badgers. Um, we used to be part of FERA, uh, a food and environment research agency, uh, and we've moved this year to our current home in the Animal Health and Veterinary Laboratories Agency. So after the excellent scientific overviews earlier on today, I want to give a, a more sort of practical talk, really sort of nuts and bolts talk about, oh, oh no, about, you know, what we've done, what's, what's happened since the license was granted that, that, that Mark talked about this morning? What progress have we made in uh, um, Badger vaccine deployment? I'm going to put some facts and figures around that as context for the whole sort of discussion. And I'm also going to flag up some, you know, knowledge gaps and things that I think are important for us collectively to think about. So the vaccine was licensed, the marketing authorization was granted in, in March 2010. And hard on the heels of that, uh, the Badger vaccine deployment project was launched in, in Gloucestershire, DEFRA funded project, um, involved a it involves a 100 kilometre square area uh, in Gloucestershire, around 100 farm premises. This is the, oh, sorry, uh, find the right button. This is the, this is the seven running up here. Uh, and all these dots that you see on the map are, are places where we vaccinated badgers last year. The point of this project really was about learning lessons about what are the, what are the actual practicalities of, of deploying this, this new tool that we had um, and the cost of doing so and also to, to build some farmer confident, confidence in, this, in the whole idea of, uh, of badger vaccination. And to that end, there's a, there's a social science project, a DEFRA-funded project bolted on to this, to this work. And very importantly as well, to be somewhere where lay vaccinators, people who want to vaccinate badgers, can come along, be trained and qualified to do so. So for those of you here who, who don't really know what, what vaccination of badgers involves, I'm going to run through the process very quickly. So, the first step is to find places where badgers are, find sets uh, um, and other, other sources of activity, if you like. The next step is to, to put traps down at places where we think we'll, we'll catch badgers. And I can't, I can't stress the importance of these two steps um, strongly enough. Finding sets may involve a, bit, a large survey. It involves accurately identifying where badger activity is, where active sets are putting the traps down in places where you're most likely to catch badgers. It, it takes some skill and experience, and, and experienced and skilled people always do this, more, do this better and catch more badgers than less experienced people. The next step is to we lock the traps open for a few days, maybe seven, maybe more or maybe less, um, and we put a, a, a bait in the trap on a daily basis to induce the badgers, encourage them to come in, and get the, the bait for a, for a food reward, and we use, as generally use peanuts for this. Once the bait is, is getting hit by the badgers, they're coming in regularly, they're eating it every day, the traps are set. This happens in the, in the sort of afternoon, and then very early the next day, and we go as, as soon as we can after, after first light, because, you know, in all of this, animal welfare is very much at the top of our agenda, and we don't want animals in these traps any longer than they need to be. Go out and check the check the traps, vaccinate the badgers while they're in the traps, and then release them. Um, and the final stage is to remove the traps and uh, obviously clean very thoroughly. Biosecurity is also an incredibly important part of this because the whole aim of this, of course, is to reduce spread of TB, not, not make it worse. So this is what happens in the first thing in the morning when uh, uh, we go and check the traps. Hopefully you'll have some badgers in, in uh, cages uh, and the badger just gets vaccinated through the cages of the, of the trap. So this, this chap's um, colleague is using a high-tech badger distractor implement here, otherwise known as a stick. Uh, so a anything that helps, you know. And usually, usually, in the vast majority of cases, it's possible just to vaccinate the badger like that fairly smoothly. Animals which are slightly more agitated, we can reduce the space in the trap using what we call our wickets so that we can still vaccinate them even though they're, they're more mobile. 
Um, <coughs> the final stage of what we do is we, we, we do a little fur clip and we do a little um, temporary uh, stock spray on the animal so that if we set the traps, if we catch it the second night, if we catch it the next night, um, we won't vaccinate it again. It will just be released immediately. And so we generally do trapping on two, two consecutive nights and all the hard work is really done beforehand, finding the right places to put the traps, pre-baiting for the right amount of time so that the animals are, are coming in regularly and then doing a fairly short, sharp hit of trapping, if you like. And then the animal is, is released and generally bolts back to the set. There we go. <clears throat> so I'm just going to say a little bit um, by way of information, really, about the training course that runs um, as part of this project. It's a four-day course. Um, it's, oh, that's what it costs. It's got classroom and field components. So in the field, we teach people the fundamentals, the basics of um, you know, badger activity, where badger sets are, surveying for badgers, where to put traps, how to set them, etc. Also the handling and the transport and storage of the vaccine. And in the classroom, we, we make people aware of the responsibilities under the, the, the legal acts within which they're working in this context. So the Protection of Badgers Act, um, veterinary medicines regulations. Um, because obviously, you know, people are working within, uh, within you know, legal structures. And it's a Lantra accredited course. The next step for a would-be badger vaccinator is to apply for a certificate of competence. And really, this is effectively um, people signing up to a, a code of conduct, a code of, a, a code of practice, if you like, to make sure that the standards of work around vaccination are maintained. You know, we're talking about, we're dealing with a wild animal here. Not only that, we're dealing with a protected mammal. And we're also working with um, veterinary medicine. So it's absolutely crucial that the standards uh, are maintained. And to that end, uh, we, go and, we go and audit the people who have come in the course and who have gone off and are vaccinating badgers. And that generally involves, so we'll go out and observe them doing their work and check on how well, you know, sort of records around vaccine, vaccine control are being kept. And this is generally a pretty positive process where we can go back and give a bit of, you know, feedback as to how things are going. To, to have a certificate of competence in, um, incurs a £700 a year cost. And I should say there is a 50% there's a, a debt for grant for voluntary and community sector uh, organisations for both these cost components. <coughs> Finally, Badger BCG is a, a prescription only veterinary medicine. Um, and so vaccinators need to work with a vet, um, a directing vet who can direct and prescribe the vaccine. And once all that's in place, vaccinators can apply for a, a license in England from Natural England and in Wales from the Welsh Government for a license to trap badgers in order to vaccinate them. So just to talk very quickly about some of the wider functions of the, the Badger Vaccine Deployment Project. So we, as well as running the training course and doing the vaccination, we administer this certificate of competence. Um, we collate data, so we end up with a register of, of lay vaccinators. And we also so vaccinate as part of the, the agreement um, lay vaccinators send back their data on where and how many badgers have been vaccinated. And it's primarily motivated by you know, control of the vaccine, but it also builds up a potentially useful resource of data, which I'll, I'll, I'll come on to in, uh, in a minute. And we provide ongoing advice. So people who have come to us to go in the course go off and start vaccinating and quite often come back to us to ask um, to ask us about you know, questions about equipment or their techniques, and, and we're quite happy to provide that. And we can pull together, because we're in a, we have all this information centrally, we can pull this information and provide summary information to DEFRA as and when required. So just some numbers, really, on progress. So in, the, in the, our project in Gloucestershire, um, by the end, up to the end of last year, we delivered 2,167 vaccines. And tomorrow is the last day of, of this year, so that number will be revised. Last year, we, we trapped just under 1,000 badgers and vaccinated them in the course of the sort of three or four month season. Since the start, we've trained 167 people who have come through the training course. And the, the, the largest single sort of group of them are government staff from our agencies and, and the Welsh government. The field work for this is carried out by a core of, of five field staff who set up the, the trapping rounds and take the take trainees out in the field and show them how to vaccinate badgers. 
um, but we have back office sort of management and data support to help administer the course and the certificate of competence, etc. And it's probably worth noting that next year is the last year of this project, and so we probably need to give some thought as to if we want to continue to train lay vaccinators, how that will happen beyond then. So just some, uh, some figures just to illustrate vaccine deployment progress. You can see how the sort of numbers of badgers vaccinated in each year since the, the license was granted has gone up. This big spike in 2012 is large and very much due to the, the, the Welsh government's intensive action area coming online. Um, and you can see that the numbers have gone from you know, sort of 100 farm premises and 100 kilometres square up to sort of over 600 premises which have had badgers vaccinated on them and about sort of 370 kilometres square. The number of organisations who are actually, who have lay vaccinators and are doing um, vaccination has grown year on year to sort of around 15, 16 this year. And just some pictures really to show you where badgers have been vaccinated. So this is 2010. This is obviously our area in Gloucestershire, the Badger Vaccine Deployment Project. And there was one small project in North Somerset. 2011, you can see there's more vaccination sort of happening more widely. Sort of notable ones. This is the National Trust's project down in Killerton in Devon. And then last year, uh, that's what the picture looks like. And you can see this sort of notable ones. This big blob here is the intensive action area in Wales, which I'm no doubt Christiane will mention later. So that's it, really, in a nutshell. Progress in badger vaccination since the licence was granted. Um, so now I'm going to talk about one or two knowledge gaps that I think are worth thinking about. So it's probably, it's not unreasonable to expect that, that vaccination will result in a reduced risk of transmission from badgers to cattle, given what we know about the protective effects in badgers. However, we don't have any empirical data with which to support or refute this. And that makes it difficult for us to understand and predict what effect wider badger vaccination will have on cattle TB incidents if we did it more widely. And uh, another less, it's not a technical knowledge gap, but I, th I think we don't know it all that well, is how to best deploy this, this tool that we have, this management tool that we have. And just for context, cost being mentioned before, and we've sort of estimated that the cost of deploying badger vaccination in this way is, can be somewhere between two and four thousand pounds per kilometre square. But I put a question mark because I don't think we've been through that exercise fully at all. I think there's a lot we can we need to think about and, and learn about different models of deployment invo involving different sort of stakeholder, potentially vol voluntary involvement, etc. I think it's early days. So, what thinking about addressing these knowledge gaps? First of all, the effect on the effect of badger vaccination on cattle TB. Well, as scientists, the gold standard would be a large randomised trial. You know where we went out and like in the, the, the badger culling trial had treatment areas, had con experimental control areas, and then we monitored the effects in, in cattle. However, the randomised badger culling trial cost tens of millions of pounds, and that's almost certainly prohibitively expensive now. Perhaps we can do this in a, more, a slightly more adaptive way. So potentially using this growing database of badger vaccinations, which we have in one place. So at the end of this year, I, I think it will probably, probably have there'll probably be around or more than 6,000 vaccine doses uh, in total delivered, which is you know, not insignificant. And perhaps we can use that data to map, map the vaccination effort. So you know, the, the number of badgers that have been vaccinated and where mapped over the underlying cattle data and cattle disease data. And that would involve designing a, an analytical protocol to potentially periodically assess the effects of badger vaccination on, on cattle TB. And we've started sort of early discussions with DEFRA and academic colleagues, including Rosie and Crystal Donnelly, who I think is here, um, to think about how we might do that. This is almost certainly a, a less powerful approach than if we had a nice big bespoke trial. But on the other hand, it's something we can probably do um, really relatively cheaply uh, with you know, building on data that we already have. And so, moving on to you know, the knowledge gap about what's the most effective use of the vaccine. So, injectable vaccine, I think we always sort of viewed it as an interim approach, something to take us from where we were now to the day in which we had an oral bait vaccine, which we've always hoped would be 
something that could be de deployed more widely and more cheaply. As we've heard this morning from Mark's talk, um, that's a, that is a significant scientific challenge. Um, it's an uncertain time scale at best. It could be four or five years. It may take longer. And as Mark pointed out, there are actually no guarantees of actually getting there. So what should we do with the injectable vaccine, the tool that we do have in the meantime? So we should be realistic. Um, there are limits. I mean, that's limited by cost and manpower. Any intervention carries a cost. Um, and we've seen what the, the sort of estimated costs of badger vaccination are. And we should also be realistic about the scale of the, the challenge. It's a huge area, a huge geographic area and a very large problem. So given our limited resources, where and how should effort be deployed? Well, in, a, in an ideal world, I suppose, where we had the, the luxury of being able to, to be strategic about it, perhaps we would choose, think along the lines of should we deploy in endemic areas where the problem's at its worst? Or would we be better moving outside the edge of the endemic areas and deploy the vaccine in an attempt to, to slow or stop spread of, the, of, of TB? And you know, would we do that in some sort of coordinated way? But maybe it's too early, really, given the, the sort of relatively small <coughs> resource that we have um, to think about such coordinated thoughts. But I think it's worth you know, keeping up there on the horizon. And that takes me to my parting shot, really, that expertise is the key. Any of these options that we have the options that are available to us depend very much on the pool of, of, of qualified and, and expertise that we have um, to deploy. Um, and we know from our experience that experienced people and skilled people catch a lot more badgers than less experienced people, but, that, but people can get better over time. Um, and so really, we need to keep building that. And that's it. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, colleagues in the research team at Woodchester all the landowners who allow us on their land to do the BVDP, and DEFRA who, who fund the work. Thank you very much. Okay.